Okay, can folks uh, see me and hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Uh, no presentation. Yeah, there we do. Maybe, there we go. maybe you have a presentation now. I'm hopeful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the more the more you go forward with technology, the worse it gets. It's like, can can people still see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so uh, I am going to be talking about just um, how much uh, you know how much data you can you can get away with not including. Um, that's sort of going to be something I'll talk a little bit. And this was sort of an experiment that I did after the end of the competition because I was sort of frustrated at the end that I had used all 1.1 million rows um, in most of my my work. And uh, I decided at the end that that had been very wasteful and that it had probably made me take far more computation time than I ought to have. Um, so first, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm Chief Compliance Officer of Datto. It's a public technology company uh, based in the United States. Um, you know, it produces IT products for small and medium-sized businesses. Um, I have a law degree from the University of Oxford, and I'm getting an LLM right now uh, remotely at Peking University, and I'm planning to move to China once the pandemic is over. Um, so I think that uh, probably everybody's um, machine learning model looked something like this um, with uh, an optimizer, a preprocessor, and a machine learning model. And the basic idea would be is that uh, you want to do as many cycles with the optimizer as you can um, because you don't want to try to, you know, hand find the best hyperparameters for your machine learning model. Um, and in order to do this, uh, you need a lot of time. And, um, you know, every, um, every uh, cycle that you take uh, is one that uh, is, 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 you know, the longer each cycle takes, the fewer cycles you can take, and your goal is to do as many cycles as you can. Uh, so uh, the basic thing I, I came away with on that was that less data uh, allows for more optimization. And so what we should do is we should try to use uh, as little data as possible. Um, and uh, at some level, uh, actually just jumping back, at some level, um, you know, it's very easy to figure out how to do this with respect to features. You know, so a, a good way to see if you've selected the right features is to take your model, train your model, and then uh, run permutation importance over the model. So, you know, you you take every column, you randomize the column, uh, and you see how much the the performance of the model degrades. And if it degrades a lot, then that feature was important. Um, and if it degrades a little, then that feature wasn't very important, and you can afford to throw it away. Um, and uh, one of the things I found, at least for my models, is that I could afford to throw away a lot of the features. Um, and so, uh, and actually my model performance significantly improved if I threw away a decent number of the features. And, and so I was probably able to throw away, you know, something like a third to a half of the features. Uh, it, it's in, you know, it's in, it's in the, um, you know, you, you could throw away a lot of the data vertically. But the other question was how much of the data could you throw away horizontally? You know, how many, how many rows can you afford to drop? Um, and this was something I, I thought about after the competition ended. And, um, you know, one of the things is that um, when I was starting out, I, I made a, you know, when I was, when I trained my first model uh, for the competition, one of the mistakes that I made uh, was I, uh, I didn't realize at first that I would need to separate my, my training and validation categories by well, that I would need to put different wells in the validation set that I would in the training set. Um, and so I had them mixed together and I ended up getting like a 0.05 error score or something like that. Um, so that said that if the model had points that were next to the points that it was attempting to predict, it, it could predict them extremely easily, um, which suggests that there's a great deal of overlap in the data between adjacent points. So after the competition ended, I uh, built a preprocessor with the capacity to thin the data set um, based upon uh, depth in each well. And I could set it to retain every N of M cases for each well. And it, just the corollary of that is you drop every M minus N of M cases for each well. And so um, 
it might be early for folks in some areas of the world. So I drew an extremely simple picture of this. Um, you know, for uh, for dropping, you know, for retaining one of three, uh, you know. So, uh, Campbell, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I'm still looking at your first slide. I'm, oh. I'm assuming it might be the case for others as well. Now can you see others? Can now we can see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then, then you were you were Thank very you. Uh, generous not to say anything, <laughs> um, and it means you missed my beautiful uh, optimizer picture. Um, but yes, essentially we can thin the wells. And so this is the picture for, for folks of just thinning the wells. It's very simple. It's probably what you imagined in your head when I said it. Um, uh, but but we, can, we can drop things very safely. You know, I created a preprocessor that I could use to drop stuff. And so then what I did is I, I just uh, ran it. And this is just a very simple experiment, but that I thought would be reasonable. Um, the model is a random forest sklearn with 80 trees. Uh, the, each model contains between 0 and 100 min leaf nodes and 0 to 100 max depth. And we do 30 rounds with Optuna, which is uh, just an optimizer if you're not familiar with Optuna. Um, SKopt is, is essentially the same thing if you're familiar with that. And this is on an Intel i7 CPU at 2.3 gigahertz with 16 cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM, uh, and tenfold cross-validation dropping uh, any feature that has more than 40% uh, in a. And uh, what we can see is we can see that we can essentially drop 95% of the data without essentially any change on the cross validation. Um, you know, with 80% of the data, I get a 0.69 error using the competition metric. And with 5% of the data, I get a 0.71 error on validation uh, using the competition metric. And that takes us from an hour and 30 minutes of training and scoring time uh, for each. Uh, for each uh, 30 rounds with Optuna down to five minutes of training and scoring time. Um, so something this shows is that you can really thin the data horizontally um, and, and not suffer a significant uh, uh, error consequence. And one, one actually uh, point to make is, uh, as the last presenter talked about, there was a real difference between the public test data set and cross-validation. Um, and that if you did cross-validation, um, you might not get very large gains, whereas changes that you could make would give you very large gains on the on the public um, on the public uh, scoring on, on the public you know the public test or what have you. Um, and one of my concerns on that, just looking at that, was that um, was that our data was not particularly generalizable. Um, and uh, that sort of comports with what I saw with group and formation being the most important features. Uh, I do not have a geophysical uh, background, um, but I assume that group and formation are things that are determined by people later uh, that sort of reflect the lithology characteristics of the things that they classify. Um, so it'd be interesting to see uh, how models would perform without group and formation available to them uh, or on oil wells in totally different regions of the world, you know. Um, so just uh, final thoughts is I thought that it might be uh, better uh, to look at using a district a distance metric uh, to determine uh, how to thin the data. So determine the distance between neighboring points uh, and then and then use that. And I thought that might be better at handling places where the kind of rock shifts and maybe that's data that I want. Um, but I realized that that would be difficult because most distance metrics are going to teach all features equally. And even if we scale the, the features, um, you know, uh, it, not all the features are of equal importance. So that might that might not be very helpful to us. Um, and uh, finally, I thought it'd be very interesting to try to determine which rows contain bad data and to remove those rows first. Um, uh, but as someone who does not have a geophysical background, I, I wasn't sure what the best way would be to identify which rows, uh, you know, contain an error. Um, and uh, and so I, I didn't have a good way to do that. So I, I didn't attempt that. But that's that was sort of just this was just sort of a post uh, a, a, a post competition interest of mine. And I just think it's it's a fascinating thing that we can thin the data down uh, to five percent of its original horizontal size um, and probably, you know, half of its, you know, vertical size or, you know, half of it, 5% of its vertical size and probably 40% of its horizontal size and be fine. 
And that's, that's, I'll turn it over to the folks if anyone has any questions.